How are you, Amelia? I've missed you terribly. Here oh, we are in two I miss different you. How have you been holding up during quarantine? It's a freaky deaky time to be living through, but um, but I'm doing okay. Good. Yes. I genuinely cannot complain. We, we, we try to take the best out of it. Use the time constructively and try to help exactly. people and uh, exactly. get our work done at the same time. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, and also try to try not to drink too much. But to, today, for our we friends are. Who, are, who are watching yeah. us, hi, hi everybody. Yeah. We're Hello. gonna start this by making a cocktail because I know this is, uh, they're watching this at the end of their big day, seminars and all that. So yes. what's better than a cocktail, right? And from the king of cocktail making. Well, thank you. Many was the day we would end a, a, a day of shooting on last Christmas with a cocktail. So yeah. today is I invented a, um, a drink for you. Shucks. My pleasure. Uh, it, anybody who knows cocktails will know. I, this is really, I just, it, it's basically a Vesper, but I put my own spin on it. Excellent. Excellent. So, so we're going to make one right now. So I, I, I'm going to show everybody how to do it. Amelia, you're going to make one with me, right? Badly. Right. Okay. First thing you want to do is we want to get the glass cold because you wanna, don't want to put a, a, a cold drink into a warm glass. So grab some ice and just plop it in there. I'm already struggling. Uh-oh. Oh my God, it's so heavy. Right, okay, I'm bringing things closer to me because my arms are not very big. <laughs> That'll do? Yeah, perfect. And then just set that aside. And that'll get nice and cold. And now take your, your mixing glass. Ha ha. And put a bunch of ice in there. This is where the cold, the cold oh, really happens. Oh, fuck. Bugger. Am I not allowed to swear? Because sorry, I already did. I can swear. Good. Bugger. Bugger! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Amelia. It's raining oh, ice. I need a new bar back. I worked in a bar. <laughs> and there's a reason why I got fired. We're experiencing it right now. See, this is really just a look back at your career and we're actually recreating famous moments from it. Oh, excellent. All right. Good. So there, so you're all okay. iced up, right? Yes, I'm iced up. Now, what the next? first thing you're going to do is get a uh, get some gin. I've got my gin. And I've got my gin. Yes, you have your own gin. Mine's Sip Smith, which is my, my gin of choice. I love Smith, Sip Smith, too. And that will be your gin of choice until you have Arding's Well, <laughs> obviously, were I to have your gin in my hands, I'd never drink anything else. Thank you so much. I can never stop selling. And now, <laughs> uh, what we're going to do is... Uh, Put an ounce and a half Whoa. of beautiful gin here. And if you're, whatever gin you're using, make sure it's a, a, a London Dry, and people who are uh, making drinks at home. You don't want to put in something that's a, more too sweet or anything like that. No, awful. All right. Yeah, done. Great, excellent. So now the next, next bit is we're going to take some vodka. Hi there. We're going to mix vodka and gin. That's crazy. It is crazy. I mean, I, I did can't even open it. This is going so terribly. Um, I did, when I was told what was in this cocktail, I was like, that's, normally it's one or the other. The vodka mellows the gin out a bit because vodka doesn't have any taste and gin right. has more taste. It mellows it out if you double up on your booze. Got right. it. So now we're going to do three quarters of an ounce of vodka. So half oh. the amount of gin. Three quarters of the amount. I mean, I'm... There we go. Oh, Christ. I mean, I couldn't spill it more if I tried. I did do quite well with my spillages when I worked behind a bar. Because you have yeah. to write down spillages. And a few spillages used to go down my neck. <laughs> if I'm being really honest. I can't believe that career didn't work out for you. Neither can I. Neither. It blows my mind. And now here, your favorite ingredient. Hi there. Yep, it's Lillet, but it's Lillet Rosé. Now, when you make a regular uh, Vesper, you just use Lillet Blanc. But for this, for you, I put in Lillet Rosé, which gets it a little bit more, um, not, I wouldn't say sweeter, just a little more flavor, I would dare say. So now we're just going to put a half ounce. A half ounce, okay. Yep. Already there is an obscene amount of liquid in this. Yeah, of course. Only being and it's all booze, too, so... <laughs> So, Happy New Year, everybody. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, I mean, seriously. And this gives it a lovely <gasps> little pink blush. Indeed. Ooh, beautiful. There we go. And now, we're just right. going to take it and we're going to stir it. 
If you want to be bartendery about it, what you do is you kind of press the outer, the, the bowl of the spoon against the outer edge and then just spin it, keeping it on there. So you're always kind of twirling the spoon in your hand if you want. Right. Got that's it. The, that's the cool guy, fancy way to do it. <laughs> yeah. You want to stir it for a good, you know, a couple of minutes because you want this to be ice, ice cold. No, definitely. You don't want to taste it too much. Knock it back. What's been your drink of choice during, uh, during quarantine? During quarantine, my drink of choice. Honestly, a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> With what in it? Yes, exactly, exactly. My specialty. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so now take the, the, this ice in here, just dump it back into your ice bucket. With a crush bang wallet. Now you take your strainer. I got my strainer. And you're just going to strain this into no, this doesn't. glass. You've got a martini glass. I've got what's called I a do. Nick and Nora glass. I do have a martini glass. Ooh, look at her blush. Got a little more of a bowl shape to it, as featured in the movies, uh, the, the Thin Man movies. Ah, very In which nice. Nick and Nora Charles were the stars, uh, the, the names of the characters, and so this is the glass they did. One final thing, I'm gonna take your lemon. I pre-did it. Someone oh good, actually, I was worried about having you navigating, but not that you couldn't do it, but. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I think that was probably the one thing I could have done. So I'm going to cut myself a big twist, exactly. So here we oh, go. Oh, very nice. Oh, very nice. I mean, I'm going to just make mine curly. And we plonk it in, right? We gracefully let it... Well, you want to, you want to just squeeze over the top. Oh. So if you put the skin side out... Yes. And then you just, over the drink, you, like, bend it in half. There ain't nothing coming out of mine. <laughs> okay. Does it feel wet though when you do it? It should the skin should feel a little bit kind of wet because it releases the oil. Let's say yes. There you go. Oh, and you stirred it and you popped it in. And then you plunk it in. And I can't drink this, Paul. I'm gonna be hammered. Right. Cheers, Amelia Clark. I need two hands because I've got tiny hands. Paul Feig, my love from across the oceans. Cheers. And back at you, my friend. I'm so happy to see you. Oh, that's good. Oh, bugger, that's really good. Yeah. No, that's really good. It's 9 o'clock in the morning where I am. <laughs> Breakfast, martini. Yes. Excellent. Oh, oh my no. goodness. Well, I'm so going to move this away because otherwise I'm going to actually drink all it. That's really, really yummy. That doesn't taste as boozy as it is. It gives it just a little something. <laughs> You're just going to watch me fall off my chair. Yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> This is my goal, to booze you up in this next uh, 45 minutes. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, but Thanks. actually, uh, uh, here's a cheers to all of our friends watching right now, to the Edinburgh Indeed. Festival. Indeed. A cheers to everyone at Edinburgh Festival. We wish we, we were with you. A sip. A sip. I genuinely am popping it down. <laughs> I wish we were there live. It's very sad not to be there, because it's I love Edinburgh so much. Me too. Oh, well, this is very exciting. We saw yes. each other so much last year uh, when we were yeah. making on Last Christmas. It's been, what, it's been almost a year and a half now since we actually made the movie. That's bonkers. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, since we did those mad hours, running around Regent Street. Yeah. Remember our first week, our call time in Covent Garden was 2 a.m. <laughs> it was the most like i asked so many of my mates and so many people i know who were in crews no one had ever done those hours before we called it a reverse splits right that was like yeah. the technical term but no one ever knew no one had ever done that before so yeah we started shooting at 2 a.m and we shot until what was it noon noon yeah. noon yeah it's like a perpetual hangover yeah. it was so weird you're like i'm watching the sun come up i'm not drunk and i'm not i don't feel sober this doesn't feel like a <laughs> Well, it was also, it was really hard to go, like, what time do I go to bed in order to be on set at 2 a.m.? Do yes. I go to bed at 4 in the afternoon? <laughs> Paul, you have, you're like the Duracell bunny. I mean, seriously, I know no one with more energy than you. It is absolutely <laughs> remarkable. I'm there on my knees being like, oh, I gotta <laughs> keep awake. And you're like I flying around. Tell. I couldn't tell, Amelia. You were great. You were Good. always, you just amazed me. This was a hard, oh. hard shoot for you. It was. Because first of all, you know, middle of the night, 
Secondly, uh -huh. you know, a lot goes into this role. This was a complicated role. Third, yes. it was freezing cold. Fourth, yes. your costume was not that warm. <laughs> no, 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 that's very true. Trying to hide like more thermals underneath an elf costume. And then I love in the edit, some of mine and Henry's keep warm dancing actually got in to the movie. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We love, my editor and I love anything that isn't supposed to happen. <laughs> we find that very yes. humanizing and the people I work with, I fall in love with who they are. And so I go like, oh, I want the world to see that. I want the world to see that. And it, I think it just makes, makes performances a little more relatable even, you Completely. know, just because, but sorry, and you had to be freezing for it. No, I mean, it's, um, Paul, it, if you're an actor, you at some point get hypothermia. It's just kind of like part of the job. Amelia, tell, tell how, because I, I was so funny when I was so worried, you go like, I have done this for years. You have a whole system using those hot packs, right? Yeah, so I basically just covered my whole costume on Game of Thrones especially. All of them, we just had the sticky heat pads absolutely everywhere. And then you'd get the, uh, the, the hand warmers that you shake and put them everywhere, in your shoes, up your sleeve down your back. The first couple of seasons was desert, baking hot. I would often have a little, I can't stand up, it's too hot, I've got a wig on. They don't make cold packs. You don't put high ice packs on yourself, do you? No, well, what the boys got, which which we could never do under my costume, because you got the guys in the Night's Watch and you've got Jon Snow, who's, you know, wearing a woolly mammoth all the time. Um, so they've got these huge costumes, you can hide whatever the hell you want underneath there, to be quite frank. So when, um, when we were shooting things in a hot country when they had all of those things, they had this pump, this that that pumped, that like had its own little generator that was attached into the costumes that used to pump cold water into these pipes and cool them all down. So they would be underneath these huge things with this weird kind of cooling system. But girls weren't allowed that. All I could get was just the back of my wig was allowed to be lifted up every once in a while <laughs> with my amazing head department going, ooh, ooh. <laughs> high tech, very high tech. <laughs> yeah, very high tech. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, you know, women in the business across the board have it so much harder for so many different reasons. I'm friends with a lot of stunt women and, you know, when they're doing stunts, it's usually for somebody in a dress or a skirt or a blouse. Yes. It's like they can't pad up. They've got these tiny little pads. You know, the yes. guys are all tough and they've got, sure, they got football gear on. So as a woman, you're largely wearing something form fitting. And so the form fittingness, yes, doesn't really allow for padding if you're doing stunts or heating things if you're cold or cooling things if you're hot, all of those things. So yeah, you just have to kind of pick your moments and waft where appropriate. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So you don't get the vapors, they used to call it back in the old days in, in, in down south with the hoop skirts and all that. They get the right. vapors, but I, I think actually indelicately, I think the vapors were when you had gas. And, oh, excellent. And it got trapped in your, in, your, in your gown and could only come up through here. So there you go, Edinburgh. There's a fact. Just wafted at the people you don't like. <laughs> What's she doing? Oh, I'm just dancing. <laughs> don't go over there. <laughs> you do see that on film sets because you're in these film sets for so long. You're literally there for sometimes 18 hours in a day. People fart. You've got to fart. You've got to go to the loo. You've got to fart. So yeah. I love it when you catch people being like, why are you in the corner? <laughs> <laughs> what if you just taken yourself off to the corner for no reason? I'm, thi I'm thinking about my lines. I can still lines. smell it. Yeah. See, that's, that, that, it's running lines code for going to <laughs> cut the cheese. I'm just going to explore this part of the wall <laughs> for a minute, really quietly. <laughs> or cough, or, yeah. Oh, Edinburgh. They're so happy about this panel right now. On my first ever job, um, I was doing, I did a, I was the guest lead in an episode of Doctors. And there was a really small space and they're like, okay, we've literally got time for one take. Like, I'm so sorry, Amelia. I know this is your debut on TV, but we got one take, so don't mess it up. And, um, and I walk into this really small office and I'm meant to look like shocked and alarmed and really upset about what I'm looking at. Just really, just horrified, horrified. And I walk into the door and as I walk in, I just hear this, <laughs> and one of the camera guys said, let one rip. And I was like, I've got one take. Look, horror, just smell the smell. Do some Joey Tribbiani acting. Just smell the smell. That will, that Could will you blame it on the door? Like, this door's really squeaky. I think you need to open it. Yeah, exactly. It. Yeah. <laughs> and it really smells, exactly. Yeah. 
This is the stuff people in showbiz, who aren't in showbiz, don't realize we have to contend with. Indeed. We're still yeah, humans. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How quickly have we got into farts? Right. <laughs> okay, but that happens a lot when we're filming, right? The corpsing on set. I mean, you know, it's really awkward when you can't stop laughing in a scene you're not meant to stop laughing in. You're not meant to be laughing in. And I, it, 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 yeah, it's a kind of, normally it's a cabin fever thing, right? So like on Game of Thrones, when we would feel, when we would all start making each other giggle and the crew were literally like, stop it. Like it's not funny <laughs> and that makes you laugh more and it's bad and you're like, I'm just, and it becomes like a, it's like it's like a disease. You just can't. You literally can't stop laughing. Yeah, it's funny. You're right. Because I mean, most crews. I find that so many crews that I work with, they get like upset when when actors start to corpse like that. Yeah. But I always like. I think it's the. I get so happy when it happens. First yeah. of all, because I know I'm going to get great DVD extras out of it. This is very <laughs> and, true. And secondly, it just means that people are in a good mood and having fun. When you're shooting those scenes where there's like thirty of you and you're round a bloody table, let me tell you guys, that's like. That's long filming. Because you not only do you need this reaction, you need that reaction, then you need that reaction to that reaction, and then that reaction to that reaction, times 30. So you're there for five days shooting that. And in the end, words become meaningless. The script <laughs> makes no sense. You're like, if I say orange another time, is it going to make sense? Am I going <laughs> to? And when that happens, and then you start, and then someone else starts, and it just kicks off. And then by the time it's come back to that person, that person may have stopped laughing, but they've started. So then you start again, and it's just endless, <laughs> endless corpsing when it is not appropriate. I like, love it. Everyone's dead. Stop laughing. You know, those speeches you have in another language, how in the name of God do you do that? <laughs> it is the hardest bit of acting I've ever done. To the point where when I'm learning the lines, I'm like, this isn't acting! I'm not at school. Why is this so hard? Because they just make no sense. Um, and then the more important the scene, the harder it is. And then you've got, rightly so, the crew being like, I don't know what this girl's saying. I, I, you know, and then you're like, where do we go from? Well, we go from, ha -ga -ga -ga. no, <laughs> just go from the top, just go from the top, just go from the top. Yeah, can so you I pick it up from the blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I just have to always go back to the beginning. And then um, David and Dan are always like, just really just make it up. I'm like, do you have any idea how hard it is to make up something that's already made up? Like, it sounds, there was a couple of takes where I basically did mbop. Like I did, I did the song. <laughs> I realized what I was saying and I was like, I mean, you've not made anything up. You've just rehashed a Hanson pop classic. <laughs> mbop. Did I, but I do wop? Again, on, on Last Christmas and just on learning different stuff, um, you know, one of the big things in Last Christmas was that, that uh, your character was a singer. Flash forward when the script came in, I was so excited with, for this part for you, and we met with you, and you wanted to do it. We made the deal and everything, and that was only the moment when I went, oh, she's got to sing in this. I wonder if she can sing. But then, you could. Yeah. No, I, yeah, it was, it was, there were so many things about this part that were just so close to home, um, and singing was one of them, because I love singing. I'm probably saying this because I don't sing as much as I act, but I am at my peak happiest when I am singing. It's like, it's just entirely my just most joyful place to be. Yeah, because I was kind of like, oh, I wonder if she can sing. And then I looked online and I found the Dolce & Gabbana ad you did, which is, oh, if anybody's Christ, yeah. have not seen it, it's the most delightful ad. You're just so great. <laughs> Similar and it, to learning Dothraki. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to talk about this or not, but, you know, when we first met, uh, you know, or actually when we had lunch that day at, at Wilton's yeah. um, to talk about the role, that was when you first told me that you had an extra connection to what this character was going through. Yes. Yes. With my brain hemorrhages. Yes. Yes. I was so shocked and surprised. I mean, now, you, you know, you wrote that beautiful article for, for The New Yorker and all that, and you've got Thanks. your amazing, uh, amazing charity now. So, um, yes, same but that, that, that must yes. have been really, really, you know, difficult it's, and it, interesting and everything about it. No, completely, completely. I mean, I, um, I only told my story in order to do good, so start the charity. And I knew I was, there was a moment where I wasn't going to ever say what actually happened to me because I just didn't feel brave enough and I didn't really feel like uh, people would care. Um, it's a celebrity sob story at the end of the day, but I then realised that I can't start a charity for brain injury without people being like, it's pretty specific. 
It's pretty, uh, it's pretty on the nose there. What's the, why specifically? So I was like, uh, to avoid that awkwardness of me just going, well, I had two brain hemorrhages. Um, I thought, let's do this properly. Okay, fine, I will say my story and that will be that and then the charity will be born and, and, and then I can go on and do good. I'm just gonna bore you for a second, but during COVID, we, um, we launched and created an online clinic for brain injury recovery. Because the whole thing with SAMU is brain injury recovery, which is a very, it's a very uh, blank space right now. Like uh, there's not a lot of eyes on it. There's not, people don't truly understand how impactful recovery can be specifically with brain injury. It can literally make or break someone's life that they have been lucky enough to survive a brain injury to live. And, um, and this online clinic is called Enroll. And it, um, what we realized is that during COVID, a lot of people who have brain injuries are gonna be leaving hospital early because of COVID patients coming in. So that's a shocking thing to happen because already you don't get enough time in hospital when you have a brain injury. So we started an online clinic whereby people who were leaving hospital early could still get the care that they needed. And it kicked off in the most beautiful way. And all of these incredible things have come out of it. And it's become something that we're desperately trying to get the funds to make long lasting and to have forever and ever I'm in. The, it's coming to an end now because the coffers are empty. Um, so now we are, um, yeah, we're trying to do all that we can to make sure that it's something that is implemented and repeated so that people, wherever they are in the world, whatever they feel, they can get the care that they need. Wow, that, I mean, and can, can people donate to this through Same You? They can, they can donate. Promote it, come on, promote it, Amelia. It's a great charity, donate. it's such a great charity. <laughs> Please donate. <laughs> <laughs> just same you, same you. Go to sameyou.org. What, uh, what's the website? Sameyou.org. There we go. Because, yeah, it's a scary time for charities all over. Same you has sadly not been an exception, but I have faith. I believe that people are going to want to help people who are really struggling. So, yep. Yeah. Well, God bless you. God bless you, Amelia Clark. You. You're, on, you're on fire. So, speaking of COVID, yes. um, your play got got oh, cut yeah. short and yes. I was so excited about this first of all I thought I was going to be in town to see it but then it all fell apart but but uh, tell us a little bit about it I love theater right that's how I got into acting my dad was a sound designer for the theater and I love theater I go and see it as much as I can I know you also share this love so I got to be in the seagull playing Nina which is like my 15-year-old self would just crap herself if she found out that, that was ever gonna happen. Um, <laughs> and with Jamie Lloyd, just next to you, Paul Feig, the most incredible director. Yeah. Um, and we're on preview number five, and that was the morning that Boris had announced things weren't looking great. And we're all at work being like, are we meant to be here? Are we allowed to be here? What's going on? Uh, and then at the half an hour call, so half an hour before you're due to walk on stage, Oh. All the people walk in and we're like, what's up? You think, I mean, we're in, we're good to the audience, uh, shall we? And they were like, yeah, no, that's a no, we're canceling and we're done. And uh, after a few tears and a lot of alcohol, <laughs> I left all of my stuff in my dressing room. I was like, it's bad juju if I leave here and I take my stuff with me. I'm not ready to take my stuff with me. Nina's, yeah. Nina's here, she's gonna chill here, I'll be back. Um, and, uh, and that was a little while ago, so <laughs> I think they're gonna be a little bit dusty. <laughs> we have faith that we will go back up in March or, well, I mean, January, but realistically probably March of next year. Good. Which theater were you in? We were at the Playhouse Theater. What an awful feeling though to be like, it's like being, you've been training, training for the Olympics and they go like, oh, and the Olympics are off five minutes before you run. You're just still shaking. You were like, but, 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 and I went through a phase of going through my lines almost every night before I went to sleep. And then after a while I was like, yeah, let's stop. Let's just stop doing it. But there's Nina is still floating around. I've not, I've not popped her down just yet. Good. She's still sailing around. Excellent. Well now uh, switching gears. Um, yes. I'm a big sci-fi fanatic, and I, ah. I think you are, Fred. Well, I mean, my CV is. I did one called Other Space that's currently, I made it, it's a, it's a comedy sci-fi show I made for Yahoo Screen back in 2015, which Wonderful. immediately failed. The, the Yahoo Screen platform immediately failed, and then I was oh, stuck God. with eight episodes of the show that I love so much and nobody ever got to see it, oh. but now it's playing on Dust. Oh, hello. So I did that, and then you did, uh, you had your, your, your Star Wars experience. 
uh, it's the weirdest thing in the entire world being in a set that is so huge and so vast and full of so many Star Wars things <laughs> and, and <laughs> creatures and, and people and just being on set for the first time, you're literally like, I can't see a camera and I kind of feel like I'm in the twilight zone. Like it is, you're there. So many projects you've done are like out of a reality that we know. Yes. Do you prepare differently for that or you just try to be who you are in well, that situation? Yeah, it's difficult, right? Because when you're doing something that is real, and especially if you're doing a time that was real, or you, there's a huge amount of research you can do. So when it comes to doing things that are in make-believe land, I mean, every part of art is in make-believe land, but, but, but yeah, Star Wars and Game of Thrones, uh, you just do as much reading around what is there as possible to try and familiarize yourself with what that is. And that is where having a really brilliant and restrictive costume helps because it changes how you move, it changes how you react, it changes how you feel, how you hold yourself, all of those things. So instantly you are f someone from a different time, whereas if you're there in your sweats, you're gonna be doing this. So sometimes I, I often thought with Game of Thrones, they had, you know, Daenerys had a rod up her ass basically the whole time because I was in a corset. But if I was to be wearing anything even vaguely comfortable, you would have got like that at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Which I tried, and they were like, "No, do the thing." And I'm like, "What are you talking about? I'm just, I'm, she's a bad, she's a badass. I want to put my feet up. I'm gonna." Slacker Daenerys, like, hey man. Yeah, exactly. Like, and they're like, "No, I see you're doing a choice meal, but don't do it. Can you just stand up straight? Like, sit right up straight. There you go." There you go. See, <laughs> I always like the actor to be very involved with with the, the wardrobe because yes. it helps them find the character, you know? And it's always so exciting yeah. when you see an actor find the character when they put on something or they find yes. something. And then we get yes. excited. Like, you know, we, we have the amazing Renee Kalfas on our, on our movie. Yeah. And it just, then we get energized. Like, oh, cool, that, then we start going. But it, that's the yeah. fun part. You look at yourself in the mirror and you're constantly getting these signals back to yourself to, to what you're seeing. So, you need as an actor to see something different and the, the the many different varying degrees of that so with game of thrones the as soon as the wig is on daenerys enters um and and that kind of changes a huge amount that, that you cannot prepare for as well so as long as you've done all of your other homework that you need to do as an actor the costume is kind of the final thing that makes you go, and there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, you know, that was even on last Christmas when we, you know, before you even came in, we were looking at a bunch of stuff, and when Renee pulled out that leopard print coat, I mean, we were all like, oh, we got so excited about it. And yeah. Then it just, then you're kind of like, oh, I hope, I hope Amelia feels the same way about it. Because I've had oh, that yeah. too, where you go like, oh, this is it. And the person goes like, nah. And, I, and I'm like, okay, cool. You got to feel it. That must be a little bit disheartening if you're like, this is fabulous. And they're like, no. It's kind of a bummer because you go like, oh, this is going to look so great. But again, I, you know, I was an actor for, for many years. I was uh, a, a regular on the TV version of Dirty Dancing. Yes, it, it oh, existed. Oh, hi there. Uh, no one puts not in very the good. I was playing a bellhop who was kind of this guy who wanted to be a comedian. And I remember they, the customer thought it'd be very funny if she put me in these, like a, like a bellboy top, but then these like shorts, almost like kind of these Jerry Lewis shorts with these high socks, like I was a nerd. And she was so excited about it. I remember putting it on and going like, I feel, I don't feel like the character at all. I feel like a clown, like I'm actually yeah. supposed to look funny. Yeah. You know, there's a, a famous old character actor who's gone now named McLean Stevenson. And I remember I kind of went to him and I was all bummed out. And he said, look, do you want to open a funny door or do you want to open a door funny? And I was like, that's it. Like if they yeah. dress me like the funny door, like, well, look, he's crazy. Then yeah. I got nowhere to go. Yeah, absolutely. Versus, and so I go in and I, and the, the wardrobe woman hated me because I went to the, I, she wouldn't relent. And so I went to the producer and I said, I don't like this outfit. I feel weird in it. And he goes, okay, we'll change it. And she, just that was it. She hated my guts after that. But oh. it was like, but I've always felt that thing of like, I know how terrible that feeling is. You go like, this yeah. ain't working for me. Yeah. It took me a really long time to ever pluck up the courage ever in a costume fitting to go, no. To ever to say that word, ever, in any part of my career. It's been very difficult to do that. But um, 
But yes, when you do, you realize that when you're in the right place with an artist who's like, okay, cool, who feels the same way as you, then, then it all works out for the best. Because you're like, okay, I can say that maybe I think this is not that one, but maybe this one, but you know. Yeah. But it can be very difficult as a young actor, I think, having any confidence to be able to speak up for what it is that you might be feeling in that moment. You just yeah. sort of go, I'm so lucky to be here, I'm not gonna mess it up. I'm just yeah. gonna do whatever you guys tell me to do. And that's what I always try to guard against because I always, I don't, I don't, you know some people feel that and it's like, I don't want to cut off your, you know, look, there are times as a director you're just like, oh, please just do what I ask you to. But yeah. at the same time you go, but that's not, I should never be that, out of sorts or impatient that it, I can't, because mm -hmm. I'm not going to get the best out of the person I'm with, because right. it has to be a collaboration. And so we have, you yeah. know, it's up to us. I have a real, you know, uh, um, frustration with a lot of writer directors because it's this right. like, say it like this. I spent three years yeah. writing this. You're going to, and it's like, that doesn't matter because now it's the performer has to take that and make it real. Unless you, the writer, are going to play the role then let yeah. them turn it into something. It has to be a collaboration. And I, they, that frustration when I see situations or hear about people being in situations that aren't collaborative. It's so funny as well because in, okay, so in drama school, the, the main rule is every answer you ever need is in the script. Like, that's it. You got the script, you're good. You do, any questions, anything, just ask the script and the script will answer you and that is it. That is right. the gospel, that's all you need. And then going into TV, it is a writer's medium. So the writer is king and whatever the writer says, you know, like I remember very, 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 very occasionally in the beginning bits of Game of Thrones where I'd be like, guys, that's American. And I realize we're in neutral land here, but I have an English accent. So I'm just gonna let you know that like maybe I would say just this word. But other than that, you change nothing. Yeah, change nothing. Largely speaking, because they're geniuses, and like, why would you ever change anything? Apart from all the Dothraki, um, but that's another, that's another point. Um, but <laughs> then when you go into film, and I remember for the first time I really saw it was on Star Wars, where they're like, yeah, we'll just, we'll just mess around, and I was like, what? Huh? The lines? I did my job. What do you mean mess around? Like, I'm not capable of doing that. And there is such an American school of thought with improvisation that, like, it's it's so different, and it can be very. It can be very um, unsettling as for someone who's come from such a historic amount of the script, the script, the script, the script, the script. Yeah. And then going into film and it's like the director, the director, the director, whatever that person says is, is gold. And the writer it sort of fades into the background, unlike in TV. It's so true. And, and it, it's, um, you know, because I'm, I'm known in my movies for doing, you know, a good amount of kind of playing around. But I never have done that thing of just like, let's just, you know, go ahead, do whatever you want, because that's just anarchy. You know, for me, it's just like, and we did it, you know, on, on last Christmas, just like, kind of make that line your own. You know, like, the, yeah. we need the, the blueprint of that scene. Code for Amelia forgot her lines. To me, that's the most effective form of, of, of you know, of improv, if you will, is just like, just bending words and bending thoughts to make them personal. I mean, I know that there are some movies and some directors where improv is it. Like, you just figure it out on the day, and yeah. we'll try. Try this alt, try that alt, try this alt. And you're like, what? Then go, okay. I didn't learn that one. Yeah. You just sprung it on me just now. Say this, they, they say this. Yeah, exactly. but it can become freeing, I think. At the end of the day, it's gotta be what the performer is most comfortable with. There's some, per, yeah. per, some actors I work with who love to just go, you know, Melissa McCarthy can just go on a thing and you're like, just, I'm going along for the ride. You know, but then I know if somebody else doesn't have that, I'm not gonna be like, well, come on, keep up with her. You know, it's, we have to do this juggle of like, okay, I wanna get the best out of everybody and make them comfortable. You know, like Anna Kendrick. Anna Kendrick didn't love, she didn't want me throwing a bunch of different alt jokes at her, but she would each time change up the performance with a different attitude. And so it felt like it was always different. You're the same way. You would just, you would just kind of surprise me with some, some emotional take on something, and then you would change a word to hear, you know, some thoughts here and there. And it's just like, oh, it's each time it's fresh because you're yeah. making it, it, whether I said like make it sadder or make it happier, that mm -hmm. you have to adjust within that. And so that's yeah. the fun collaboration yeah. that I'm always looking for. Yeah, exactly. And so there's so many people out there, young people uh, who want to get into the business, who want to do something in this business. What words of wisdom would you have for them, my friend? Uh, I, okay, this is genuinely what I would say. 
if you want to be an actor, is there anything else, anything at all, that you could really see yourself doing? Because if there is, then do that. Because if you're acting, I mean, it, 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 it's a rocky road. And so you have to love it with every fiber of your being. You have to need to do it like you need to breathe. Because if you don't, then it just isn't worth the pain and the heartache that comes along with being self-employed. And then if that answer to that is, there is nothing in this world I'd rather do, then um, my the other bit of advice that I would say is watch everything. Familiarize yourself with as many movies as possible, as many TV shows as possible. Keep your ear to the ground with who's doing what and why. Go see live theater, go see live performances, go see dance, go see live music. Yeah. Absorb stories on a level where it's just gonna feed your work. And it's also gonna make you best positioned for when the appropriate moment comes and you're in the right room at the right time with the right people, you know exactly what to say because it's coming from a place of robust understanding of, yes, I wanna do this more than anything in the world and I, I, I wanna do it so much, I know everything about this. I know what stories I like, I know what stories I wanna tell. Because if you know that, if you know not only what you like but what kind of work you in the beginning see yourself doing, do you know what I mean? You're kind of, you get to be in a room and, 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 and be very authentic with, as, to, as to why you want to do what it is that you want to do. I really uh, relate to what you said about like, if you think there's anything else you want to do, get out. Because you have to live and breathe this industry. So many times somebody will go like, can you talk to my nephew? He's thinking about getting into the business. It's like, if he's thinking about getting in the business, don't do it. Like, no. he should be yeah. like, I'm gonna get everything in my life out of the way because this is all I can do. 100%, 100%. And there are, there are actors and there are creatives who came to it late, but those people who came to it late came to it organically. Someone asked them to do something and then they did it and then they went, oh my God, I gotta do this for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that is a totally legitimate and real way. But if you're a young person who is sitting there going, I think maybe this is what I wanna do, you just have to know. For me, my my acting skills were of a certain limit versus when I would be work with other actors and go like, oh, I know how to make them better. I know how to use them effectively. Yeah. I know I know what role that person should be doing. That was kind of opened me up. And the biggest thing I've found over the course of my career is you've got to find your own voice. You know, yeah, like you say, you know, you're watching all this stuff and you go like, oh, I want to do that. I want to do that. Oh, I want to be like that person. I want to tell stories like that person. But then at a certain point, you need to not copy everybody and then mm -hmm. start going like, I like this bit, I like this bit, I like this bit, put this together and then what is it coming through that is actually me? And that's where you find that's your exactly voice. exactly it. You have to find what's meaningful to you and go out and make it. Yeah. Go out and do it. That is, that is so accurate. <laughs> that's how you do it. So, so kudos to Edinburgh. We're sorry it's not happening here, but even, you know, look, if you can't be stopped, put on a Zoom play, you know, do whatever it takes. Exactly. Keep working, keep getting your voice out there, make videos in your yeah. cell phone if that's the only outlet you have. Because if yeah. you're not doing, if you're sitting around waiting for people to hire you, like you say, it's not going to happen. And we also need more different brains working in different ways, thinking outside the box as to how to tell a story. We can never, we can never run out of that. Yeah whatever you know part of society you're from and you don't see yourself represented on the screen or whatever that means you need to really be telling yes. your story you need exactly. to get your voice out there tell the stuff that we're not hearing because that's what's so important that's why i have this company called powder keg that we're doing all this short form stuff but it's all for you know women of color and, and, and lgbtq and just any voice that's not being heard because you know we can only hear the same stories over and over again at that point where you know it's what you want to do, you're watching everything and you're reading everything and you're trying to find your own voice. When you're there, take yourself seriously, is what I would also yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. Allow yourself to take yourself seriously. Whatever idea, wacky or not, or underrepresented or not, it has value. Yeah, So. exactly. Yeah. And, and, and a, a final thing onto that is be hard on yourself. Uh, not in ah, a way where yes. you're going to make yourself miserable, but be hard on what you're doing. Because, you mm. know, w if you make something, go like, I'm going to put it on the internet, make sure it's good first. Because like our company, we scour the internet looking at stuff, you know, and if yeah. you find something, go like, well, that wasn't very good. You kind of don't get looked at again. And so it's like, yeah. just because you did it doesn't mean it's fantastic. 
Show it to people you know. Show it to people. Make them be honest with you. Don't just go like, oh, you know, like yeah. go to people who are going to go, you're great. Because when the minute you be, get out of that bubble, everybody's going to be really hard on you. They're going to be hard on what you do. Yeah. But that's good because, you know, you, you no, need exactly. to take it seriously. That's like you said, you have to bring your A game each time. Even if it, the point you're at, your A game is only a C game, it's your A game at that moment. Yeah. And you're going, this is the best I can do. But that's exactly. good because then you're exactly. moving forward. Yeah. There you go. Get out there and do it, everybody. Yes. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think that our time might be up, friend. Oh, well, cheers. Cheers to you. Thank you. So beautiful to see you. And I will be seeing you in London in October because you're moving here. I want to thank all of our sponsors for this. I got to thank Sky yes. for putting this in and getting thank this together. Sky. Edinburgh Festival, everybody, Ian, Georgia, everybody involved. Amazing. We love you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Cheers.